8th of May, 1945. At last, the darkness was lifted. The people celebrated victory over Nazi Germany. From the D-Day landings on the beaches of Normandy in June 1944, it took the Allies almost a full year to win the war. Eleven long months of fierce, often cruel combat to plant the red flag on the roof of the Reichstag. Eleven months of hopes and fears. Eleven interminable months to defeat a Reich which had promised to endure for a thousand years. Those 11 months, with the highest death toll of the war, left an eternal scar in hearts and on history. Summer 1944. For nearly five years, Europe had been at war, awaiting its liberation. On the 6th of June, the winds of freedom finally began to blow over the beaches of Normandy. On the evening of the longest day, more than 150,000 soldiers had made it to land. By the 1st of July, almost one million men were fighting in Normandy. The Allies had control over the skies. They were systematically destroying the infrastructure used by the Germans. All their convoys of reinforcements were targeted. Even Field Marshal Rommel, the head of German forces in Normandy, was wounded in an aerial attack. A joke began to do the rounds in the German ranks. If you see a white plane, it's American. If you see a black plane, it's English. If you see nothing, it's the Luftwaffe. And yet, the outcome was far from settled. The Germans put up fierce resistance. The British General Montgomery hoped to take the port of Caen within 48 hours. In the event, it took six weeks and carpet bombing that flattened the city. At last, in the final week of July, the front gave way. The Americans managed to break through on the Cotentin Peninsula. Allied troops liberated Brittany, while General Patton's rampaging 3rd US Army liberated town after town and pushed east. The liberation of Western Europe was finally underway. Western France was in ruins. The population were embittered, but after four years under the Nazi jackboot, there was finally hope. The mood was one of confidence. We'll cut through Germany like butter, predicted a colleague of General Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander. This mood of optimism was heightened since on the Eastern Front, a huge offensive was underway. Stalin had unleashed Russian forces in Operation Bagration. His objective was to seize Belarus with the subsequent aim of opening the route to Warsaw, which in turn controlled access to Berlin. The Red Army was advancing like a steamroller, crushing everything in its path along a 1,000 kilometer front. More than a million men, 4,000 tanks, 25,000 cannon, and 5,000 planes came at the enemy. Nothing could stop them. 
the strong man of the Kremlin showed he had a sense of history, Stalin waited until the 22nd of June to launch his offensive. Hitler had attacked Russia three years beforehand to the day, on the 22nd of June, 1941. On this front, the Soviets went from one victory to another. Hitler had ordered his generals to apply a fortress strategy, to dig in, in a few well-defended places to contain the enemy and force him into long and bloody fighting. By imposing a war of movement in 1940, Hitler was a step ahead in terms of tactics. By pegging his generals in citadels, the Fuhrer had now taken a step back to old-school war. On this front, the Soviets went from one victory to another. Vitebsk, Orsha, Mogilev, Bobruisk, Minsk. The cities of Belarus fell one by one. Vasily Grossman, correspondent for the Soviet army newspaper, the Red Star, noted, the road to Babrusk is the road of retribution. Here, the cauldron of death boils swallowing up in merciless vengeance all those who have not laid down their weapons and fled west. To slow the Russian advance, the Germans carried out a scorched earth policy, ravaging towns and destroying all infrastructure. But nothing could halt the Red Army, neither the blown up bridges nor the thousands of mines laid by the Germans. Their progress was so rapid that they were running out of fuel. To keep up the pace, Russian soldiers sometimes mixed vodka and diesel oil to keep the tanks rolling. One German corporal wrote to his wife, if the Russians continue in this direction, you won't have to wait long before they're on your doorstep. Hundreds of thousands of Germans were killed or captured. Many of them had not yet reached the age of 20. Many surrendered when they had the chance. The liberated territories were in flames. The liberated populations had lost everything, their belongings, often their homes, sometimes even their lives. To celebrate what was one of the biggest defeats inflicted on the Wehrmacht, Stalin paraded 60,000 German prisoners in Moscow on the 17th of July, 1944. Three years earlier, Hitler had promised them they would march through Moscow, a promise now fulfilled. Attacked from the west by the Anglo-Americans, from the east by the Soviets, the Reich was threatened with sudden collapse, especially since a major blow was about to be dealt to its head. Convinced of the imminence of defeat, a circle of German officers wanted to eliminate Hitler so they could open negotiations with the Allies. On the 20th of July, while the Fuhrer was meeting with his top brass, the bomb went off. The blast caused huge damage. But despite the violence of the explosion, Hitler had miraculously survived. He suffered a burst eardrum and a dressing covered his ear, but he was alive. Not everyone was so lucky. Several men who were with him were gravely wounded and would later die. That same day, 
Benito Mussolini, who still reigned over the northern half of Italy, paid him a visit. His right arm still in a sling, Hitler welcomed him and told him, Duke, a short while ago, an infernal machine was set in motion against me. When Hitler showed him the location of the attack, he said, the bomb exploded just by my feet. It's clear that nothing can happen to me. My destiny is to pursue my course and complete my task. I am more certain than ever that the great cause which I serve will triumph, despite the current dangers. Hitler interpreted his survival as a sign from heaven. Mussolini refrained from contradicting him. Before leaving, Il Duce told him, after this miracle, it is unthinkable that our cause might fail. When the Germans learned that Hitler had survived, many wept with joy. Thank God the Fuhrer is alive. This was the sentiment heard on the streets of Berlin. For in July 44, many Germans still thought their Fuhrer represented the only hope of winning. The very evening of the assassination attempt, the dictator addressed his people. The bombing heightened Hitler's natural tendency towards paranoia. Opposition figures, real or imagined, were mercilessly hunted down. This hunt was led by a hardliner, Major General Otto Ernst Bremer. 5,000 people were detained. The conspirators were almost all arrested. This was followed by swift trials. Certain generals, smartly dressed a few weeks earlier, now appeared before the judges in shabby clothes, looking dirty and haggard. Erich Hopner who fought in campaigns in Poland and France. Marshal von Witzleben, former commander-in-chief of the Western Front. Having had his belt taken away, he had to hold up his oversized trousers to stop them falling down. Judge Freisler, a fanatical Nazi, showered them with insults. <laughs> He shouted so loud that the technicians responsible for recording this parody of justice asked him to bring the volume down. The sentence gave no recourse for appeal. Some 200 people were executed. The executioners selected particularly fine ropes to prolong the agony of their victims. Among the conspirators was one special case, Field Marshal Rommel. He was a national hero following his victory in Tobruk, but his links with the plotters meant Hitler wanted him gone. To avoid upsetting public opinion, he gave him a choice, suicide or public trial. Rommel opted for suicide, with the assurance that his family would be spared. The regime staged a grandiose state funeral for him. The ordinary Germans knew nothing of his role. Officially, the Desert Fox died as a result of injuries sustained in Normandy. Following this brutal purge, Germans tended to become more fervent to avoid being suspected of half-heartedness. One had to show loyalty to the Fuhrer to the bitter end. In the army, the Heil Hitler salute replaced the traditional military salute. The regime placed its most trusted men in the top posts, 
starting with the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, who was appointed as replacement army chief. He now had full powers over two million men. Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda, became the Reich's overall Minister for War with full powers. Pleased with these enlarged powers, he wrote in his diary, it took a bomb under his butt for Hitler to see reason. The bombing hadn't broken the regime. On the contrary, it had consolidated it. However, the Allies were still advancing, both from the east and the west. Farther south, in mid-August, French and American forces landed in Provence. The GIs of General Patch and the soldiers of the 1st French Army, commanded by General de Latre, began to make inroads into southern France. Helped by the FFI, the French forces of the interior, they liberated Marseille before moving up the Rhone Valley. But these images of a humiliated Wehrmacht are misleading. The large majority of Hitler's soldiers managed to pull back. More than 400,000 made it back to Germany and prepared to defend the fatherland. Far from the front, back in Germany, news reports screened in cinemas strived to brighten up daily life. In the summer of 44, despite the bombardments and while the Reich was teetering, for many Germans, the war was still distant. The images testified to the comfortable lifestyle and folklore traditions that reigned in the country. The Germans still had faith in Hitler. And how could they do otherwise when the party was omnipresent? The population was well fed. The factories continued to operate. The administration was functioning and Berlin Zoo remained open. It was a wonderful summer and those at home made the most of it. The war? What war? Yet this bathing filmed in August 1944 was in the town of Dachau. A few kilometers away, the oldest concentration camp in Germany continued to exterminate deportees arrested from across Europe. While Germany basked in the summer sun, occupied Europe remained in the grim shadow of the Nazis. The regime pursued its policy of annihilation. Between the 7th of June and the 9th of July, 1944, more than 435,000 Hungarian Jews were sent to the death camps. In August 44, the crematoriums at Auschwitz could not keep pace with the number of bodies piling up. The SS began to burn them in open pits. Even as the Allies approached Paris, one last convoy of deportees was leaving for the death camps on the 17th of August, 1944. Only a week later, on the 25th of August, Paris was liberated. The Allies did not expect to make such swift progress. After four years in exile, General de Gaulle saw France regain its statehood. The Americans also made themselves at home. The 4th Infantry Division paraded triumphantly amid the cheers. Quand un soldat de l'armée américaine chez nous se promène sur les boulevards pour bien se faire comprendre il a de la peine il se démène et pique son phare. The Parisian women hugged their liberators. Euphoria could be read on the faces. Oh la la, good morning, mademoiselle. Oh la la, I go to l'opéra. Oh la la, je speak pas very well. Oh la la, c'est-il là ou pas là en souriant? <laughs> 
La petite parisienne dit gentiment, justement, je vais par là. Oh, oh. Many GIs thought the worst was over and that defeating the Reich was now no more than a formality. Summer held the promise of victory. Fall would deliver a series of setbacks. Since the D-Day landings, the US General Eisenhower had lost confidence in the commander of Allied land troops, Britain's General Montgomery, who had overseen a string of failures in Normandy. Despite these setbacks, Montgomery demanded to run operations against the Reich, placing all Anglo-American forces under his command. But this demand was unacceptable for Eisenhower. To avoid putting all his troops under Montgomery, Eisenhower divided his forces into two groups. The first was under Montgomery's command. It would attack via the north towards Belgium and the Netherlands with the objective of seizing the port of Antwerp. Once in Allied control, tanks and munitions could then be shipped closer to the front. The second group was assigned to the US General Bradley and would attack to the east backed by the armies of Generals Patton and Simpson. Things moved fast from September 1944. The British under Montgomery continued their advance and took Brussels. In the Belgian capital, the population celebrated wildly as Paris had done 10 days earlier. The following day in Antwerp, the victors captured hundreds of prisoners, but did not know what to do with them. The zoo was quickly reassigned. Although the Belgian authorities hailed Montgomery, he made a mistake. In the rush to invade Germany, his troops had taken the port of Antwerp as planned. But Monty had neglected to clean out the islands and banks which control its access. They were held by heavily armed German units. As a result, no Allied shipping could use the port and supply the front. This new failure enraged Eisenhower. And for good reason. For two long months, Allied troops now had to break down German resistance through dangerous amphibious operations. Some 13,000 men died in the process. But it would take more than that to undermine Montgomery's self-importance. The Englishman wanted to demonstrate his strategic talents to Eisenhower. Even with the command of half the troops he had called for, he would succeed. His aim? To be first to cross the Rhine. This achievement would erase memories of his failures and would eclipse the victories of his rival, General Patton. The American general, a big mouth who carried pistols with ivory butts, had liberated town after town, moving from Normandy to the east of France. Monty was envious. In a move that looked like arrogance, he persuaded the skeptical Eisenhower to give him all available resources. His objective? To launch a huge parachute operation on Arnhem in the Netherlands. Codename, Operation Market Garden. On the 17th of September, 1944, 20,000 parachutists and 14,000 combat troops carried by planes and 563 gliders took off heading for Holland. It was the biggest airborne operation in history. The American, British and Polish parachutists were dropped behind the German lines to take a series of bridges across the Maas, the Waal and the Rhine to stop the Germans destroying them. Once these bridges had been secured, land troops could go round the defences of the Siegfried Line by the north and invade the Reich. Monty was sure of himself. Thanks to his shrewdness, the war would be won by Christmas. 
Unfortunately, the situation on the ground soon became tricky. The gliders landed, but some crashed. The drop zones were too far from their objectives. But Montgomery had, above all, overlooked one detail, the Germans. They got hold of a glider and recovered some equipment and supplies. But more importantly, they also found a plan of the operation that an officer had taken with him in contravention of orders. When the 4th Brigade was dropped as reinforcements, its parachutists were shot out of the sky like pigeons by Germans who were expecting them. In the town of Arnhem, two panzer divisions raced towards the British powers and besieged them. After five days of dogged fighting, Montgomery's soldiers were forced to surrender, and the German newsreels displayed the prisoners. Für Sie ist die Operation Berlin, wie General Eisenhower dieses Unternehmen bezeichnet, zu Ende. Sie haben sich abermals damit abfinden müssen, dass der von Churchill für diese Tage festgesetzte Termin der deutschen Kapitulation nicht nur erneut auf unbestimmte Zeit vertagt werden musste, sondern niemals in Frage kommen wird. In total, the Allies lost 17,000 men and only liberated part of the Netherlands. The failure of the expedition was only the beginning of a terrible disaster. To help Operation Market Garden, Dutch railway men went on strike. As a reprisal, the Reich blocked all food imports to occupied Holland. The queues lengthened outside the food stores, which were all but empty. From October onwards, famine took a terrible toll. Thousands of civilians died of hunger. Henry, aged 10 at the time, recalls, nothing was more important than food. I woke up in the morning thinking about food. We used to talk about food all day long. And when I went to bed, hungry, I dreamt of food. The Dutch suffered for long months in what they called the hunger winter, the winter of hunger. At least 16,000 civilians perished. While Monty was halted in Holland, Bradley's US forces were making progress. In early October, his troops reached the German town of Aachen. Germany had finally been reached, but not conquered. The Americans demanded the surrender of the town in vain. Hitler ordered his troops to defend the town to the last bullet. The first US Army had to take the town street by street, house by house, in a fierce combat. I don't understand, said one GI. They know they will most likely get killed. Why on earth don't they just surrender? After 19 days of siege, during which a 1,000 GIs were killed, the town finally fell. The Germans experienced for the first time what many people across Europe had felt a few years earlier when they fled the Wehrmacht hordes. The taking of Aachen was a symbol. It was the first German town to fall into Allied hands. This toehold in German territory was a long way from spelling victory. 
The Anglo-Americans were stalling in the face of fierce German resistance. Monty had failed in his operation in the Netherlands. The port of Antwerp was still impracticable. And the hard-driving General Patton, who was eager to pursue his advance eastwards, was deprived of fuel. My men can eat their belts, but my tanks have got to have gas, he raged. He was at a standstill. In a further twist of irony, part of his fuel had been attributed to the British. With Patton slowed down, the Allies were unable to exploit the breakdown of the Western Front. As a result, the Germans had time to regroup their defences, taking up positions beyond the Rhine. The Western Front was blocked. War over by Christmas? That dream had evaporated. The war would go on. On the Soviet side, Operation Bagration was a success. Russian advances were impressive. Between the 22nd of June and the 31st of August 1944, their offensives had put 700,000 Germans out of combat. The troops under General Zhukov's command covered 500 kilometers in five weeks, almost as quick as the German tanks in the other direction in 1941. The Soviets were approaching Warsaw. In the city, the Soviet artillery could already be heard rumbling in the distance. Radio Moscow called on the population to rise up. Convinced they would be backed by the Red Army, the Polish secret army launched an insurrection on the 1st of August. But its fighters had only makeshift equipment. They seized some German helmets, along with some weapons and a few tanks. The first days were euphoric. In the exuberance, barricades went up in every neighborhood. Everyone took part in the combat in their own way. Soon, the Polish controlled parts of the capital and their flag flew once again over a few roofs. These heroic resistance fighters threw everything into it and drove back the Germans. The Polish knew the Russians were just nearby, the other side of the Vistula. With this powerful ally waiting in the wings, the insurgents had nothing to fear. But on the 4th of August, the Germans sent reinforcements. Their mission? To eliminate the Polish problem by whatever method. The city was mercilessly shelled. Gradually, the Germans retook control of the city and crushed the insurgents. The hospital was torched, the wounded executed. The resistance movement could have tipped the balance if it had had support. But the Red Army stood on the sidelines. While the German forces destroyed the city, the Soviet troops camped on the banks of the Vistula. Stalin was unmoved. He would not intervene. For a while, he even refused permission for the Americans and British to use his aerodromes to supply the insurgents, leaving them to face slaughter. He had a dual motive. He had to allow his troops to recuperate their strength after Operation Bagration. 
The Supply Corps had to bring up fresh fuel, weapons, munitions, and spare parts to this new front line on the Vistula. Meanwhile, Stalin left the non-communist Polish resistance to be wiped out, so he could put Polish communists in power at a later date. The Anglo-Americans protested, but not so strongly as to threaten their relationship with Moscow. That was the price of the Soviet alliance against Hitler. The uprising in Warsaw ended in a bloodbath. Some 220,000 civilians and resistance fighters died. After two months of fierce combat, the guns fell silent. The Polish general, Bor Komorowski, signed the surrender on the 2nd of October. The resistance army surrendered. 85% of Warsaw was in ruins. The Polish, who had hoped for support from the Soviets, now feared falling into their hands. As one poet put it, we await you, Red Plague, to deliver us from the Brown Plague. While the Red Army camped on the Vistula, to the west, the Allied armies had at last been able to open the port of Antwerp, through which supplies were now flowing. The Americans had reached the Rhine. The Reich was finally caught in a pincer. But despite this attack on two fronts, the Nazi regime showed no sign of crumbling. On the contrary, the army blindly obeyed its supreme leader. In October, Himmler created the Volkssturm, the People's Storm. This militia recruited men who were not already serving in a home defense force. At a stroke, the provincial solicitor, the teenager in the countryside, or the village baker found themselves armed with a rocket launcher to defend the Reich. The German people were still solidly behind their Fuhrer. They couldn't imagine any alternative to the Nazi regime. This was because during the 12 years he had been in power, Hitler and his regime had indoctrinated the Germans. In 1944, the Nazi party still had 8 million members. There wasn't a family in the country which didn't count at least one party member. For those in any doubt, the propaganda of Dr. Goebbels endlessly hailed the superiority of the German soldier and declared that Allied coalition would end up unravelling. His fables persuaded the Germans that they would triumph. In December 1944, Germany had been holding out on two fronts for nearly five months. The Reich was wounded. It was bleeding. But on the economic level, the country redoubled efforts in factories producing tanks, planes, submarines and munitions. While they couldn't win the battle in terms of quantity, German engineers invented new weapons like remote-controlled miniature tank buster vehicles and one-man torpedo submarines. <laughs> 
But above all, Hitler put great store in what he called miracle weapons. The V-1 flying bombs, which had been raining down on London since June and had killed thousands of civilians. The V-2 was the first ballistic missile in history. For several years, they had been secretly developed in the Reich's factories. In the fall of 44, they were finally ready. These rockets could carry one ton of high explosives. Although these retaliatory weapons had a limited impact, they galvanized the Germans. One young man wrote, all we talk about is the V2. Perhaps we can launch them against America. I'm sure that victory is ours. This industrial prowess was due to one man, Albert Speer. The Führer's architect supervised this reorganization, which he portrayed as a miracle. Because despite the Allied bombardments, weapons production had actually increased up to July 1944. But this unholy miracle bore a name, slavery. The Reich exploited millions of workers, deportees, Jews, communists, resistance fighters. There were also labor conscripts, rounded up from across Europe. Prisoners of war were turned into workers. Almost nine million men and women worked in atrocious conditions on behalf of the Reich. German industry could thus keep up with the war effort. The Reich was even able to go from being on the defensive to the offensive. On the Western Front, the division of Allied forces into two blocks had left the sector of the Ardennes dangerously ill-defended. That was where Hitler decided to strike. On the 16th of December, to the astonishment of the Allies, 1,900 cannons opened fire. In the first few hours, the element of surprise gave the German high command an unexpected success. The Allies thought they were dealing with a routed army. Instead, they found themselves facing a fierce counterattack. For Hitler, it was a big gamble. He hoped this offensive might stabilize the Western Front, convincing the Anglo-Americans that they could never win, and who knows, maybe even prompt them to side with him against the Bolshevik demon. The Fuhrer was convinced the East-West coalition was against nature and was destined to break up. Marxists, allied with capitalists, it was simply heresy. This alliance would crumble. It just needed to be dealt the coup de grace. The Germans made progress, helped by the bad weather, which prevented Allied aviation from intervening. The advance was spectacular. One lieutenant wrote to his wife, you cannot imagine the days of glory that we're experiencing at the moment. It is as if the Americans cannot withstand the might of our thrust. The 5th Panzer Division captured almost 9,000 GIs, many of whom were black. This gave the Nazi propaganda machine the opportunity to claim the US Army was made up of subhumans. The news spread in Belgium and Alsace, both of which had only just been delivered from the Brown Plague. The Germans are returning. Civilians who had only just returned to their homes took to the road again. As they prepared to celebrate Christmas, German families also celebrated this new offensive. What a wonderful Christmas present one could hear in the streets. Goebbels' pollsters noted, People are profoundly happy that we have seized back the initiative, especially since no one expected it. This operation reinvigorated the German population, 
One soldier wrote to his wife, the snow must be stained red with the blood of Americans. We're going to cast them into the ocean. The arrogant, loud mouth, apes from the new world, they will not set foot on our Germany. But the determination of the German soldiers sometimes escalated into bloodthirsty fervor as they committed numerous war crimes. On the 17th of December, 69 American prisoners of war were shot dead by the SS. A few days later, in the little town of Malmedy, the bodies of 86 GIs executed by the same SS unit were discovered. Belgian civilians, men, women and children were also massacred. They spared no one. Meanwhile, chaos reigned on the American lines. To add to the confusion, German commandos disguised as Americans had infiltrated Allied territory, switching roadsides and carrying out sabotage. The GIs were suspicious of everyone and everything. They intercepted vehicles and carefully checked identity papers. They were told to ask questions that only an American could answer. In one of the most critical periods of winter, 1944, the military police would ask at every checkpoint, who is Donald Duck's girlfriend? What is Roosevelt's dog's name? Sometimes spies were captured. the German troops pushed on with their breakthrough. They besieged the small Belgian town of Bastogne, a crucial strategic point for the success of their operation. 18,000 GIs were defending the town. In their ranks, the rumor spread that the Germans didn't take prisoners. The American soldiers doubled their efforts. But the town was quickly surrounded by panzers. The US troops were caught in a trap. While he was preparing an offensive further south, General Patton was called to the rescue. In midwinter, he swung his army around 90 degrees and headed straight north, pushing hard for Bastogne. He had promised Eisenhower that this maneuver would take him no more than three days. His tanks drove day and night through appalling conditions. They had not planned for icy roads, but managed to keep moving forward. Meanwhile, in Bastogne, the GIs were up against the Germans and the weather. Many died frozen in their foxholes. On the 26th of December, the Germans looked up at the sky in horror. The snow had stopped. The snowflakes had been replaced by the heavy bombers of the US Air Force, which pounded the German positions. Soon after, as he had promised, Patton's Third Army came to relieve the siege of Bastogne. Just in time. Hitler's gamble had backfired. The human cost was high. On the Allied side, 80,000 men killed or injured. The Germans counted 120,000. Overall, the battle merely pushed back the hour of reckoning for the Reich but it came as a wake-up call for the Allies. 
they had realized one thing, Germany was still dangerous. At the Führer's headquarters, the mood was one of concern. Goering suggested to Hitler that he should seek an armistice. The war is lost, he explained. Hitler replied, I forbid you to take any such decision on this point. If you disobey my orders, I'll have you shot. Hitler was wrapped up in his delusions. He insisted, we will never surrender. We may go down, but we will take a world with us. Despite the withdrawal of Hitler's armies on all fronts, five months of war and chaos still lay ahead before the fall of Berlin and the defeat of the Third Reich. The beast was weakened but not yet dead, and the Germans seemed ready to follow the Fuhrer to the very end. 